the girls from Russia and the girls from Ukraine in the dormitory. And they'll have a talk to each other and then I'll laugh. We're friends. Uh. It's not a joke. It's not a joke. This is real war. So what? Like in the olden times. But it means people do, don't need to talk? I was making a joke. So have ah. a um, so it's a joke it's not a joke. Right. My point is, when was the last time we had a war where a joke, right? people were yeah. bombing civilians, yeah. killing people? Wow. It's, it's like Second World War. When was the last time something happened? I guess terrorists do this. Yeah, terrorists for sure. Always happening. <sighs> Try not to joke around you, huh? <laughs> Make you nervous. Okay. something nice I did something nice now that i did it i'm wondering if i did it right should i be everyone can't take one of these what what did she do what did she do Yeah, this is good. Okay, take one of these. Let me take one of these. Okay, look through this stack and see what I did. Um, most, it's, it's just Chumash, it's just Chumash. So some of it is Chumash with, uh, from Pashas yesterday, most of it's my Pasha, let us see. Um, don't apologize. Uh, most of it is from our Pasha. Some of it is from Mishpatim. Some of it is from Kitisa. And some of it is from Vaischanon. So what I did was all of the Psukim that are not from our Pasha Yisrei, I put in bold. So you could tell them apart. And what you have is chronology. The first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day. And then the sixth day is when they begin the Teda, Shabbos. Okay? So you see what I did? You see? I'm supposed to say, wow. <laughs> Thank you very wow. much for saying wow. Okay, let's go. Rivka. Sarah. Good morning. Maya. Good morning. Devora. Good morning. Chava. Good morning. Roten. Good morning. Rachel. Mama lost both of them. Okay, Chana. Chana. Ne. Shayna, you were here before, right? Yeah. Take it here for a second. Take off your hood for one second. Prison. Oh, put it back on. Okay. <laughs> uh, Michal, oh, you're here. You're here. You're here. So who did I see downstairs? Your sister? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you were your sister. Your sister was you. Okay. I feel better. My ego took a major blow. Now it's unblown. Okay. Uh, okay. Mrs. Heber, I'm putting your name on the list because I need more names. Okay, far gesund and kum gesund. You're Michal. Oh. And your last name is Becker. 
Sharon, S H, huh? Sharon, shall we? Okay, please take one of these. Can you, uh, Mrs. Haber, take it to Israel. It's a gift for me to you. And give one to the young lady in the back who just came in. This is, is this wired or not? Uh, if it's wired, it has to stay. If it's not wired, it can be closer to myself. If it has enough power, you can put it right in front of me. Yeah, it's okay. Put it. Now behave. Okay. What's very professional? It looks professional. The more you know, the less professional it is. Trust me. It, works, it does what I needed to do. That's the important thing. One is a view as a camera, and the other is a lot. The class are live on the internet. These classes are live on the internet. I can watch it. In Israel, yeah. And what's funny is if the classes are missing. For a while, they took us off Facebook. I got so many complaints, it was delicious. That's good. Yeah, so we put back on Facebook. No more complaints. Your Facebook? Or yeah, inside Hasid is Facebook. I don't know what Facebook, I, Nechama does it. I don't even have access to Facebook. I have no access, not to Facebook and not to YouTube, but uh, I'm on. <laughs> like. Say that again? Me. Just Wednesday. Yeah, but I put all my classes up. I know. Yeah. Okay, shall we? I want to tell you how this all started. I started teaching here in the summer of 1991. That means I'm working here 30 years plus. Or that young guy. About 10 years in, like 2001, 2002, we were in Crown Street for a while. I don't remember in Crown Street. And I would come to class. I had 15 girls in the class and eight tape recorders. <laughs> Everybody was recording me. Tape recorders. You don't even know what tape recorders are. Yeah. So I figured if it's good for them, it's good for me. So I started to record my classes. I, just, I put on a tape recorder, recorded them. Then Yocheved came to me, Yocheved Seidman, and she said to me, would you like to put your stuff online? I don't know what happened. I had actually asked other people to help me put my stuff online. And then she created the Inside Hasidus. It was originally called Rabbi Paltiel and Gmail. And then it was, don't put your name into your website. It's too pretentious. So it became Inside Hasidus. And that's what we are. Okay. Okay, girls. Uh, we're in the middle of a sicha. If somebody needs one, I have a couple more. Rebetzin. This is for you. Okay. Now, I just want to say, I handed you a stack of pages, papers. As I'm looking at it, I'm realizing I could make it even better. What I did was, I found online, they have these websites that put up online Toyota in a very, very easy way, and they actually allow you to copy and paste. So this is either Safaraya, one of those other websites that you know that you can just go online and you can find Sifri Toyota. And I, I, I cut out from the Chumash pieces and I pasted them. And what you have, if you look at your sheet, you have the first day, the second day, the third day. The first day would be Monday, the second day would be Tuesday, which would be Bay Sivan. The third day would be Wednesday, which would be Gimel Sivan. The fourth day would be Thursday, which would be Dalit Sivan. And that's how I did it. But 
what you have is more than our passion. Part of the story of Matan Teir is in Pasha Yisrael. Part of the story of Matan Teir is in Pasha Mishpatim, and a little bit of in Kifisa, and a little bit is in Boaz Chana. So I compiled the Psukim of the Chumash from three different places, from, our, from four different places, Pasha Yisrael, Pasha Mishpatim, Pasha Kifisa, Pasha Machanan, in chronological order. So you go from day to day, from event to event. I, I'm thinking that I could make one small modification still, but this is not bad. I spent some time this morning doing this. I was, I was fantasizing about doing it. I finally had a half an hour. I sat down and I did it. So if you look through these pages, you'll see the story of the event of Hashem and Gavin Zateda according to the timeline in which it occurred, not how it's written in the Chumash, or according to the timeline that it happened according to Rashi. Now, any time I incorporate Pesukah from a different parasha, I put the type in bold, so you should be able to see the difference between the Pesukim of Pashas Yisrael and from the Pesukim of Teda from Pashas Mishpatim and the rest, okay? So I'm giving this to you to hold on to because I want to refer back to these notes again and again and again. As we learn the story, it's going to take us a while. As we learn the story of the event of Hashem giving us the Teda, I want to refer back to these Pesukim so we can see the timeline, the chronology, the Hishtal So I'm just telling you what I did and I'm giving it to you now. Get back to our Sikh girls. The Jewish people came to Harsin on a Monday. That's what we're going with the Rabbana, they're doing Rabbi Yassi. They got the Tate on the Shabbos. They came to Harsin on a Monday, they got the Tate on the Shabbos. So Monday was the first of Sivan, Tuesday was the second of Sivan, Thursday, Wednesday was the third of Sivan, Thursday was the fourth of Sivan, Friday was the fifth of Sivan, and Shabbos was the sixth of Sivan. Lukula Alma Bishabbos Nitna Taira, we got the Tate on Shabbos, the sixth day in the month of Sivan. In the Sikhs that we're learning, which the Psukim, of course, address, we learn that every single day of these six days, there were different events that occurred, different rituals, different events, different things that happened that touched the Jewish people as we to Har Sinai. What happened the first day? Two things that we know. One, Rashi means in Chumash and the Mechilta, and the other is a Gemara. Rashi says, in the source of it is the Mechilta, that on the first day, which was a Monday, the Jewish people achieved a status of one man with one heart. And Rashi says, further, without complaining and without arguing. So the Rebbe explained to us, why do Jews complain? Why do Jews argue? Because Moshe is pushing them. Hashem is pushing them. When somebody pushes you to do something and you feel like it's too much, you push back, you get upset, you complain, you catch. Hashem is pushing the Yidin so fast. They came out of the time 50 days before. He's pushing them, he's pushing them, he's pushing them. Yeche, 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 faster, faster, faster. Why? Because he's giving them a lot. Because he's giving them a lot, it's important that the Yidin give back a lot to make them worthy of all the gifts that they're getting. And as the story plays out, the Yidin slowed Hashem down. We slowed him down. We were supposed to go into Israel in a year. We ended up going into Israel after 40 years because the pace at which the Abishter was moving was far too quickly for us. We couldn't handle it. And basically we plotted, we failed. And we ended up spending more time in the Midbar. The whole history of the Jewish nation, the whole history of the purpose of the world, the whole history of the Tater was changed by our inability to keep up with him. But he's pushing us. So every time they move, they complain. They complain to Hashem, they're not ready to move. And they argue. They argue with each other. I'll get to you in a minute. I didn't forget you. What are they arguing about? They're arguing about what is the meaning of this move? What is the spiritual? What is the mystical? What is the inner meaning of this move? Every time you geographically move from a place to a place, you are spiritually journeying from a level to a level. And the Jewish people complain to Hashem about the burden. And they argue with one another about the meaning of the journeys. Now, on this Monday... The first day in the month of Sivan, the year 2448 from creation, the Jewish people traveled the great distance of one kilometer from the city of, from the place called Rafidim to the Har Sina. One kilometer, one kilometer, you could see a kilometer in, in a clear day. And the Pasuk says that the Yich and Shami saw Mega Dahad Ashes Kisha Khan Levi Khan is one man with one heart. No arguing, no complaining. So the Rebbe says that's an amazing accomplishment. The Jews always complain. The Jews always argue. Because they're always trying to understand why Hashem is moving them and what is the meaning of the move. 
Now they reached the station, they reached the place where it was clear. They accepted it. That's what the Mechilta says, that's what the Rashi says. Are we good? Do I have your attention, please? Huh? <laughs> okay, go ahead, what's your comment or question? In a different class, we learned that- That's a terrible thing to do. <laughs> you can go to that teacher and say that you learned in a different class, meaning me, but to tell me what the teacher said, very, very dangerous, but go ahead, proceed. Well, they said that um, the children were like um, guarantors for the Torah, well, we're supposed to accept Hashem like without any, and we're not supposed to have anything to say, oh, like we need this in order to accept you as our king, but Hashem can require that from us. Is there a question here? Yeah, why is it, oh, why can Hashem like require us to put our children up as guarantors, but we aren't supposed to go to him and say, that we need a specific thing in order for us to like crown him as king and make him our God. But we do. We do go to him and tell him what we need. And we're supposed to. I went to see on the Rebbe where the Rebbe asks the question, how does it happen that on Rosh Hashanah, which is the holiest day of the year, when we're crowning Hashem as a king, we're asking for material needs. And the Rebbe's answer is because we're telling him what we need to fulfill his purpose. So th th this is the contradiction between one sikh and another. In the sikh that I learned, the whole point is that you can ask Hashem for all your needs, provided that you're asking for your needs to be able to serve him. So I don't know. I don't know. Well, we also did ask. We asked to be able to hear him directly. Because at first it was only Moshe telling us that we this Moshe. So we complained, we protested, yeah. So we said, we're not gonna, like you said before, the lawyers, right? We don't want like a lawyer if you want directly, but this is we directly. We're gonna have lunch together, yeah. The <laughs> Yeah. It didn't work out so good, huh? They forgot the bench. <laughs> But don't you understand that when he says he wants our children to guarantee, what does he really say? That we're going to raise them. That we're going to raise them. We're not going to raise our children and say, when you'll be big, you'll decide for yourself how you're going to live. We're going to raise them to be Jews. That was our commitment. We committed our children. And we commit our children means we dedicated ourselves to the task of, I hate to say this terribly cynically and old fashioned and non-progressive idea that our children should be like us. That's what it is. That was the commitment we made. So when we committed ourselves to give our children, we were really committing ourselves to give ourselves but to give ourselves in the kind of way that would sustain the title, that it would last, that it would continue. You follow? But then there's a Gemara. And the Gemara adds one more little detail about that Monday, the first of Sivan of the year 2488, 448. And what is that detail? That when the day that the Jewish people travel from the place called Rafidim, a complete kilometer, an entire mill, 2000 Namas, from the freedom to Sinai, says the Gemara, Moshe told the Jewish people nothing. Because they were tired from travel. Remember that? He told them nothing. They were tired from their trip. Each day, Moshe came with new instruction. Each day, Moshe came with new insight and detail about preparing to get the Tere of Makadosh Baruch Hu. On Monday, he gave them nothing. Nothing. And the Jewish people came to Moshe and said, instruct us. He said, come back tomorrow. Why not today? Today you're tired. You took a long walk. You walked a whole kilometer. And of course, the Rebbe asked, the Rebbe questioned this. We know as a matter of fact that the Jewish people were so desperate to get the Torah, they were counting the days. How do they let Moshe get away with this? On this first day, when they finally arrived, as they say in American, on location, they're at the spot. Well, the title is going to be given. And Moshe says, now go take a nap, come back tomorrow, you're tired. The Jews are tired. We're hyperactive. We have adrenal, adrenal energy. We have adrenaline pouring through our veins. We are so excited to get the title. We can sleep. Teach us something. Moshe says, no, 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 come back tomorrow. 
So the, the Sicha that we learned has two halves. Last week, we completed the first half of the Sicha, where the Rebbe gave us the first insight about this question. How could Moshe Rabbeinu say nothing? On the day that the Jewish people arrive at Har Sinai, if the Jews are so anxious to get the table. So the Rebbe says, Moshe said nothing because the Jewish people had taken the greatest journey of their life. The Jewish people on that first day, on that Monday, Reish Chaydish, even the first day of the month of Sivan, took the greatest journey of their life. They journey to a place of harmony. They journey to a place where all of them would agree about what Abishta wants. All of them would accept that Hashem wants this. They wouldn't complain to Hashem and they wouldn't argue with one another. They were tired, not from walking 2,000 steps or whatever it is. They were tired from reaching the state where they could all agree. The idea that all Jews agree and they don't argue and they don't complain is an incredible journey. And this is the Rebbe's first answer. Why on that Monday did Hashem not tell Meisha Rabbeinu? tell the Jewish people anything because they were exhausted. What were they exhausted from? They were exhausted from reaching a state of Ahmed. Now, if you were here last Wednesday, at the end of the class, we sort of veered into Shalom Bayes. Remember that? I got some comments on the internet about the Shalom Bayes piece, right? <laughs> Shalom Bayes is not about being right. Shalom Bayes is not even about doing the right thing. Shalom Bayes is about getting along. And if getting along requires keep your mouth shut, even if you're right and the person you marry is wrong, that's called shalom bias, to figure out how to accept each other. But you don't want to lie. You don't want to be a phony. You can accept the other person. You can accept the other person's faults. The other person can accept you. And may I dare say, accept your faults. But it's not a phony. It's a genuine relationship. It's a genuine relationship based on the fact that this is not important. It's not important. It's not important. Right? I, I, uh, this past, it's just Kislev, right? I, I make, I'm a public speaker, I'm not the world's biggest. I'm a teacher. I'm much more a teacher than a public speaker, <laughs> but you make a lot more money in public speaking than in teaching, I can assure you. Um, <laughs> my grandmother calls it working to support my job. Um, so when you travel, you make, it's, it's Fanosa. This is not Fanosa. This is uh, whatever it is. It's holy work. Um, so this past, this kiss of an idea came to me and I, I spoke in five different places on five different nights. I read the same speech five times. What did I say? I said, people develop relationships, all kinds of relationships, business relationships, personal relationships. How do they develop relationships? By negotiation, they meet each other. They size each other up, right? They, size, they spend time together, they size each other up. And then they figure out, could I work with you or could I not work with you? The ultimate example of a relationship of people are sizing each other up is a man and a woman, a husband and a wife who are looking for a mate, they want to get married. So they meet and they talk. And everybody acts on their best behavior, but hopefully people at least have enough honesty to say what they truly believe and feel. And then the two people size each other up. They're judging each other. When you're on a date, you're judging somebody. Now, of course, it says in America, thou shalt not judge. It's one of the, I have a list of the American Ten Commandments. I don't know if you've ever seen that version, a different version of the Bible yet. Yeah. I am God, my God, there shall be no God to me other than myself. Those are the first two commandments. Um, but one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not judge. And there's fine print, except for certain people that's a mitzvah to judge. <laughs> but not about a judge, but when you go out on a date, you're shopping, you're in a store, you're looking for an outfit, and you say, oh, I can't, I don't want to make that outfit feel bad. If I'm not going to like it, the outfit is going to feel bad. So I'll say I like it, even though I don't like it, because you're not allowed to judge, right? Of course, that's very logical. So when you're dating a guy or a girl, you're judging. You're deciding if this person has the qualities you need, you need in your marriage, whatever they may be, everybody has different needs and uh, you wanna live together peaceably. So you're judging, you're judging, right? You go out with this boy and you, you, everyone is very respectful, and very, very nice. But the fact is that this is, I call it shopping. It's the ultimate case of shopping. When you're looking for a mate, you're shopping. You're, you're going out, you're enjoying yourself, it's very pleasant, but really what's going on is you're shopping. You're looking for a person to marry. It takes time. Uh, over time, you make a determination, yep, I can marry this person. And then, uh, as they say in the Bible, you go to the oil, right? And then you're officially engaged. Now, what happens now? What happens now? What happens now is you have to stop judging and accept. 
First of all, when you were judging, when you were still dating, there were things about this person you saw that you didn't like, but you said, eh, I can live with this. Mm -hmm. Second of all, you don't begin to know the person you married until you're married for years. So you, you judge this person, you decided you could marry them, and then you married them, and you find out that you judged wrong. <laughs> this person has this problem and that. You know he snores. Did you know he snores? No one tells you, by the way, I'm a snorer. <laughs> 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 There's some examples you can say in class, but most things you cannot say in class. You understand the important stuff you can't say. So what happens now? You marry this person. You accept. The shopping is over. I bought it. It finished. You know how long, long it takes to accept the person you marry? It takes years. It doesn't happen. The dating can take two months, yeah? The acceptance takes 20 years. It happens slowly. And the beginning of marriages are very exciting, but there's so much fighting and arguing. First, you try to be nice to each other. The first couple of weeks, they say, I'll give in, I'll give in, I'll give in. One of the two people gives in, maybe more times the girl than the boy. But at some point, you had enough. You know, you're married three months, six months, the guy is doing something that you can't stand, and you finally said something, and boom, you have your first fight. I used to tell my students years ago, when you have your first fight, you just got that, that, that's when you get married. Now when you sit under the chuppah, when you have your first good, delicious fight, and you come back from it. What happens? You, you, you realize that this is not, this guy's complicated. The things about him I really don't like. And guess what? The things about you, he really doesn't like. The process of learning how to accept takes a very long time because it's a maturity. It's not a mathematical thing that I married the right person, that I married the wrong person. Is it worth it? At this point, there's no cheshboinus. It's just saying, I want to be married. In order for me to be married, I have to like this person, hook, line, and sinker, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And they have to do the same thing back. And if one or both of the members of this couple don't have the ability to do that, they can be married for 50 years. They were not married for one day. They were business partners. Marriage is about acceptance. And that's where love is. When you accept a person, the mindless and the chasrenus, and you are fortunate enough, and it's really very, very special, to find a person who accepts you, this is where love is. Love is really unconditional. Love means me and this person are not thinking about what that person is. We're just one. We're a couple. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. It is. It's the hardest, I think, hard, the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. I think even harder than raising children is being married. We can argue about this, but it's one or the other. Even teenagers? What about teenagers? You said it's even harder than raising children. By the time your kids are teenagers, you don't have any control anymore. Um, it's what you do while you're able to raise them. Once they're teenagers, it's really not in your hands anymore to a very, very great extent. You raise kids when they're little and you raise them so when they turn into adolescents, there's respect so that you can continue to influence them, but it changes over time. Um, I think, that I, it's my personal opinion, I think about it a lot. I think the hardest thing to do is to be married because you have to be accepting. But what you get back is that you're accepted. And it's, it's a, it's, it is the most beautiful thing in the world. It's mamish, the most, if, if a marriage works, much each and much a toiv, it's really the most beautiful thing in the world. You, you, you're never alone. A married person has the deepest and highest kind of companionship. It's, it's, there's nothing like it in the universe, really. There is nothing like it in the universe, but the foundation of it is acceptance. So you just kiss live. I was talking about chassidus. I said, uh, you develop a relationship with God. How do you develop a relationship with God? You judge him. What's the judgment? Number one, does God exist? Is he? Is he not? And once you decide he exists, you know, what kind of guy is he? Do I like him? Do I not like him? But at some point, you have to stop judging him and develop a relationship with him. And in having a relationship with God, it's like a relationship with your spouse. It's got to be simple. You can't keep on deciding whether he's right or wrong. That's the way it works. So my Yutas kiss of speech was that that's Hasidus. Hasidus is about the idea that our relationship with the English is based on acceptance. We accept him and he accepts us just like a couple. The negotiation, the judging you do before. Hasidus teaches us that our relationship with Hashem has to be simple, not complicated. Simple is not simplistic. It's like saying a, a married, a couple, and some of the most interesting, most, most beautiful couples I have known in my life were very interesting. I have seen couples that were so odd. She was a genius and she was articulate and she was sociable. And he was a meek little nebuch. 
They had such respect for each other. I don't know how that marriage worked, but it don't matter. It worked. It worked. The mutual respect that he had for her and she had for him was, was mamish, it was beautiful. And they were very, very different. You couldn't understand how it, in other words, she, she was literally, in her sleep, she was more intelligent than him. But they had, they, he, she really respected him. She respected his chasidus, his sincerity, his emes. You understand? The, the marriage begins when you stop studying. Your relationship with the Abish is also supposed to be simple. That happened to Shchidesh Sivan. We came to Arsina and we didn't complain and we didn't argue. You understand? So they were exhausted. <laughs> they were, this 20 years, that's 20 minutes. How long take you to travel a kilometer? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. A kilometer, a kilometer is 2,000 namas. I mean, I figured that a mil is the kilometer. I decided that. A kilometer, a mil is, is 2,000 namas. In Allah, there's a debate whether the hilok mil is 80 minutes or hilok mil is 24 minutes. If hilok mil is a kilometer, it's 18 minutes. If hilok mil is a mile, it's 24 minutes. But even a mile, people walk three miles an hour. I, I don't know the difference in what the big, bigger step, bigger steps, smaller steps, but there's a machlekes in Allah how long a hilok mil is. But a mil is 2,000 amis. 2,000 amis, if, if an amis, if an amis 20 inches, so it's 2,000 uh, times one and two thirds. 2,000, one and two thirds is a little bit less than 4,000 feet. It's less than a mile, it's a kilometer. A kilometer is 3,900 and something feet. I think a mil is a kilometer, it's my personal opinion. Mil is not really gemara. A kilometer is a model, model measurement. I think it's the same thing. They walked one kilometer, a din kilometer, from a place called Rafidim where they complained and they argued and they fought. They came to have Sinai. Everything's good. It was a complicated marriage. Why? Because the Kish Echad, the Lev Echad was with Hashem, not with each other. With Hashem. They came to terms with God. And by coming to terms with God, they came to terms with one another. Because all their arguing, all their fighting was about God. They were, what were they busy with? They were busy with developing a relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. This pace was so rapid and the stress was so high that they kept on complaining and they kept on arguing. On this particular day, Yidin came to a state of relatedness with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We're married. My first expression, for better or for worse, he's mine. <laughs> for better or for worse, he's mine. Right, a, a girl marries a boy. He's an eccentric. Right, eccentric is a nice word from Shugner. <laughs> he's eccentric. He's shtick. He's mishikazim. And every once in a while, he'll do something which is so embarrassing. Oh my God! Goes to a wedding and he does something nobody else would do, or whatever, some kind of public place. So you can get upset and nervous and ashamed if you're better for words in mind. I don't say this, but that's what a marriage is. We achieve that in our relationship with Hashem, with God Almighty. So the Rebbe says, you don't understand why they were tired? What do you think it took out? If I'm telling you that it takes 20 years to accept your spouse, and I, and I believe that, you're not married yet, right? You'll get married and you'll know. After you're married for one year, you'll look at each other and you say, you know, we thought we loved each other a year ago. Oh, now we love each other. Yeah. And after two years, you'll have the same conversation. And after three years, <laughs> and after 20 years, you'll forget to have the conversation, you understand? But every once in a while, like every decade or so, you say, you know, if the marriage works, and marriage only works if people work, marriage is not by itself. And what you're doing more than anything else is accepting, really. What you're doing more than anything else is accepting. Accepting what it is, whatever it is, it's mine. That's the framework. If you have that and you have trust, you have peace. You didn't come to Har Sinai and they accept Hashem. They accept whatever he wants. What's the proof? There's nothing to complain about, there's nothing to argue about because whatever he does is good. Says the Rebbe, the Gemara says, Yidin were exhausted. Maybe they come back tomorrow. What were they exhausted from? What is it? You know what it means to accept in a day? In a day, not in 20 years. Questions or comments? Okay, I'm breaking now. I'm stopping now. We didn't learn a lot. I'm stopping now. I'll come back in five minutes, piat minut. And we're going to learn the second half of the sikh. Okay?
Chul Shadorcha, which means tired from the trip, fatigued from the journey, is nit nod an for chasav, such as the lack. You walk a long distance, you're tired. You psychologically push yourself very far, you're tired. For a human being in an intimate relationship to go from the place of judgment to go to the place of acceptance is incredibly difficult and it's tiring. But that means that the tiring is a bad thing, right? I worked hard and I got tired. So it's a good, it's an excuse, but it would have been better if I worked hard and didn't get tired, right? Fatigue, weakness is not a good thing. It's, an, it's a reality. Sometimes you work very hard, you get tired, but no one's going to say it's a good thing. Oh, I'm so wonderful, I'm exhausted. <laughs> you're wonderful that you have energy. You're also energy that you, you're wonderful that you used your energy. But when a person is tired, the fatigue itself is not advantageous. Why you're tired may be advantageous, but being tired is not by itself a mindless. So the Jewish people traveled very far. They achieved the status of Shalom Bais, of acceptance of Hashem, it's a wonderful thing, but their being tired is a symptom of running out of kayak. So the never said, you got it all wrong. The khush of the orcha, the fatigue from the trip in this case is not an deficiency. Nor be in your in this particular case, to be sure. The yidden being tired is actually not a result of working hard, it's an aliyah in the Jewish people. Being tired is a wonderful thing. Being tired, not being tired is proof that you did a wonderful thing. In this case, the fatigue itself is wonderful. Now, girls, I'm going to do something which I never do. Go to the end of the sikha. Go to page 14, please. Go to page 14. I'm going to come back to this. Go to page 14. First underline. You have it? When the Gemara, when the Gemara says, that Hashem, Moshe Rabbein told the Jewish people nothing on this Monday, the Shchei Dish Sivan, in the year 2448, because they were tired from traveling. So the Rebbe says these words, you're listening. Di Orcha, this trip, Halicha Ruchnis, this spiritual journey, as Aleyidin, all of us, for Moshe Rabbein, we're beginning with the greatest of the great, which is Moshe Rabbein, with the imposture of Shudim to the lowest and simplest of us, which is Moi, shall be Israel amongst the Jewish people. Zolin is Ahedved and should become one, right? So there's two parts. For us to have Shalom Bayes with Hashem, we have to have Shalom Bayes with one another. We accept God, amazing, and in accepting God, we all find out that we get along with one another, except one another. It says the Rabbi, it's Fabundin Medchosh, it has to do with weakness. But weakness is Lamal Yusa, weakness is an advantage, right? What's the example for this? What example for this? What example for this? Kedusha and Klippa. I'm going to provoke you. I'm going to wake you up. Yeah? The Jews and the Nazis. Oh, I got your attention. <laughs> Hitler hated the Jews. You know that? He hated the Jews, right? Why did he hate the Jews? He hated the Jews on different levels. Practically, he hated the Jews because he blamed the Jews for the, for, the, uh, for the priest treaty at Versailles. He blamed the Jews, the communists, whatever they call for the for the end for the armistice, the end of World War One was uh, was not a it was not a we didn't the Germans didn't lose they surrendered, and then there was the Treaty of Versailles which gave the Germans very very bad conditions. It was cruel. He blamed the Jews for the Treaty of Versailles. Not he blamed French Jews. He blamed German Jews. But the Germans were involved. The Germans who went to negotiate representing the Jewish, whatever it is, and he blamed the Jews. That's the political explanation. But what was the what was Hitler's did to the Jews in general? You know what Hitler said about Jews? They make people weak. They have mercy. They're kind. They're forgiving. They're helpful. Hitler was an evolutionist, period. Strict. What's a strict evolutionist? If I walk in the street and I see you fall down because you're too weak and you're too tired, I go, but you'll take your wallet. Survival of the fittest. I'm stronger than you. But I'm going to get old and I'm going to fall down. Someone's going to take my wallet. It's not bad. People, animals are incredibly efficient, right? They have reflexes. They run very fast. They hear very sensitively. They see very far. Why? Because they have to survive. Imagine you put animals in a place 
where they don't have to think and they don't have to be sharp because they're going to protect them from their hunters. They'll become fat and blind and deaf huh? and uncoordinated and slow. Hitler said the human, the Jews introduced to the world religion. What's religion? Be kind. Someone is sick, help him. Someone dies, bury him. Someone is hungry, feed him. Don't take away his shoes. So Hitler said the Jews are destroying evolution. They're stopping evolution. Evolution said human beings are hard and tough. That the whole German model, hardness and toughness. Huh? You're hard, you're tough. You do exercise, you're physically fit. You're better than everybody else. A superior race. Why? Because we're harder and tougher. And the Jews make us soft. That's why, that's the real reason he hated the Jews. Jews make us soft. And to be sure, he had the Christians. It's documented that when Hitler, Hitler said, the day I finish with the Jews, I'm going to turn on the Christian religion. Because Christianity comes from Judaism. And it has at its base kindness. Hitler was against kindness, like Sudan. Because kindness makes people weak. When someone is crying, punch him in the nose. Not allowed to cry, not allowed to be weak. To be strong and tough, to become better. This is a philosophy. Huh? How did Hitler come to be? How did such a human being be created? There's a, there's a long story, not for now. Uh, it's his fault. But he doesn't talk. I told you he doesn't talk. He talks less than your husband does. You can't even argue with him. It. It's all his fault. Now wait, I mean that. Now wait, now wait, now wait. And Hitler lost. He created a Germany based on hardness and they were broken. What does that prove? What does that prove? Now listen carefully to what I'm about to say. That soft is harder than hard. Write this down. <laughs> soft is harder than hard. The Jewish people are soft, yeah, but we're still here. All those who try to defeat us using strength destroy themselves. Soft is harder than hard. And there's a Gemara that says this very succinctly. One line. The Talmud says, the Gemara says, You should be soft and flexible like a reed. Don't be hard like a cedar. What's tougher, a grass or a hundred foot oak? Know what an oak tree is? Yeah, it's a big tree. It's very hard wood that they use to make fancy schmancy uh, furniture, right? The wind blows and the oak doesn't budge. And you have a little tiny grass, you blow on it, the grass moves. So who's tougher, a grass or an oak? What's the answer? Depends how hard the wind is blowing. If the wind blows too hard, the oak has to bend. But the oak cannot bend. So it snaps, right? I was told not to clap because it's going to ruin the mic and the whole speech is going to come out messed up. Not a lot of clap. It's going to break. You understand? If you're soft, you bend and you pop back up. So there's, this is a Gemara. Better be a Jew. Don't be a German. Be soft and flexible than hard and firm because when you're hard and firm and you have to bend, you break. If you're soft and flexible, you bend, you pop back up. And if you know Kabbalah, and of course, all of you know Kabbalah, everyone's an expert on Kabbalah, right? As long as no one knows any Kabbalah, we're all experts. One guy figures it out and we'll become a maratza. Since no one knows, we all know a lot of stuff. And Kabbalah says, this is toyu and tikkun. Elam atayu is hard. Elam atikkun is soft. Kedusha is soft. Klip is hard. And soft is harder than hard. So the Rebbe says, the Shchidosh Steven come and the Jewish people become weak. Weak doesn't mean they run out of energy. Weak means they pour all their energy into becoming soft. So the weakness is not weak. I have no koyach. Weakness is investing in weak. It's investing in softness. And that's how they achieved acceptance of God and acceptance of one another. Let's read the Sikh inside, the Vakasha. Yes, page 14. Uh, a first, second column at the beginning is Allah yid all the Jewish people from Meshach Rabbeinu from Meshach Rabbeinu. Biz then poshut shem b'pshut m'she Yisrael to the simplest of Jews. Zolon is achet veret to become one. Is fabunden mitchul shalem al yusa. 
It's connected to weakness, but weakness is good because weakness means softness. And when you're soft, you bend and you don't break. Achalisha, so bitl and yidn, a softness and a bitl in the Jewish people. And as a result of that softness, as a result of that bitl, they were able to accept God. And in accepting God, they were accepting one another. So what is the meaning of the word? And Rosh, Monday, Rosh Chaydesh, even Moshe didn't tell the Jewish people anything. Not that they were tired from the trip, but they took a trip to a place called tired. They travel to a place called softness. Chulcha doesn't mean weak, Chulcha means soft. Chulcha the journey of that day was not a journey of who's stronger, who's smarter, who understands better. It was a journey of who's softer. Says the Rebbe, who behest them was that in conjunction with this, like Amalu Vulaimini, Moshe told them nothing because Diachon, the idea of preparation for Matan to accept Hashem. The idea of preparation of Matan Teda, where I stop sizing up my partner and deciding if I like him or don't like him or what I like him but what I don't like, but I accept him. Says the Rebbe, is nitfa bundamatan amida, has nothing to do with instructions, has nothing to do with things that require strength. Now, thus is an Indian from lay Oman. The whole idea is be quiet, shtik o bittle, silence and bittle, silence and acquiescence. That's how you achieve softness. So Mishim Chulsh to Orcha means that they were tired from the trip. They traveled to a place called tired. They tried to a place called soft. How soft? I have no complaints at Abishna. And I get along with all the Jews near me. That's pretty impressive, huh? Jews getting along. <laughs> What's wrong? <laughs> Did you understand? So according to the first chat, the Sikha, the Yidin traveled and they became tired from traveling. Where did they travel to? They placed, traveled to a place called acceptance. According to the second chat, the Sikha, they traveled where they traveled. They traveled to accept. And acceptance is soft. Acceptance comes from weakness. The ability for a person to be soft, the ability for a person to be accepting is the basis for success. There's a, there's a drasha that all the Rosh Shivas give. I have an acquaintance who always says this word. I, I never heard this from the Rebbe, but the Mastagdim say this word a lot. That there's a Gemara about Rabbi Kiva. But Rabbi Kiva was drowned at sea. His, his ship capsized at sea. And he fell into the ocean. And they thought for sure he died. And then days later, he washed the shore. They found him. So they asked Rabbi Akiva, how did you survive? He said, very simple. Every time I saw a wave coming at me, I bent my head. I didn't resist. I bent my head. I didn't fight it. If I had fought against the wave, he slapped it. Now they'll do that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a person who's going to watch this and be insulted. But I, I'm not making fun of you. I'm just having fun. I'm not at you. I promise. I'm not. I'll try my best. So every time he saw a wave, he bent his head. The wave went over him. He was still there. So sometimes soft is harder than hard. That's like Chosh Orcha. They, they journey to a place of softness, a place of silence, a place of weakness. There is more strength and weakness than there is in strength, right? Is it good to cry or is it not good to cry, huh? Is crying strength or crying weakness? You know the story with Elie Wiesel? You know the story with the, the chief rabbi? Rabbi, uh, I love telling the story. Rabbi Lau, I, I love talking about Rabbi Lau, an unbelievable Jew. Rabbi Lau tells a story on, 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 on the, the JLI. He told it by one of the conventions, the uh, JLI retreats. He, huh? he converted my money. He converted your money. Converted. He's the chief rabbi of Israel, the, the, the former chief rabbi, Rav Arashil Yisrael. He's a Holocaust survivor, an amazing man. So he tells the story. He was the youngest child in Auschwitz. He was nine when the war ended. He survived with Nisan Nisan. He was nine when the war ended in 45. Amazing. So they took a whole bunch of children who were orphans and no parents. And they put them in an orphanage outside of Paris. There were 300 children. He was the youngest. And the oldest were 17 year olds. And he tells the story. I was with Eli Wiesel. Eli Wiesel was his friend, Eli Wiesel. Eli Wiesel. Eli Wiesel was 17. He was nine. And they're both in the same orphanage. There were a bunch of children. And there was a lady, a French woman, I'm assuming a French Jew, who took care of them. And she was very maternal. She was incredibly nice. 
She loved them and they loved her. She really, really took care of them. These are children with no fathers and no mothers. No fathers and no mothers. Nishka tata, nishka mama. They had nothing in the world. They were orphans. They had nothing. They had nothing. They had nothing. They didn't have cousins. They had uncles. They had nothing. Nothing. And this lady was looking after them. And one day she comes to them and she tells them that going to be dignitaries coming from Paris to this camp, to this place where these orphans are. And they're going to give them all gifts. And the dignitaries are going to be French. So the kid said, really, when they sent 75,000 Jews from France to the concentration camps, yeah? <laughs> these same dignitaries, and yeah? now they want to come and we don't, want, we don't want them and we don't want their gifts. Tell them they shouldn't come. We don't want their gifts. We don't want to see them. French dignitaries really sent 75,000 Jews to the gas chambers. We don't, need, we don't need their gifts. But she knew that this was very important because she had to pay the bills. You know, the, uh, so she said, I'm asking you to do it for me, please. I'm begging you. They, they, it's very, very important that they come. It's very important that they see you. Do it for me. So he said, okay, but you will do it. So they put up a stage on the lawn. Dignitaries came four or five different people. So the kids all came and they turned their backs. They stood with their back to them. The speaker spoke and the kids had their back to them. When they offered them gifts, these kids had nothing. They didn't take the gifts. They had nothing. They had nothing. They had the sacks they were wearing. They didn't take the gifts. So you had one speaker, speaker, a second speaker, a third speaker. The last speaker was a French Jew who was in Auschwitz. And he survived and he came back to France. He had a big business before the war. He came back over the war and he got his business back somehow. So he was a wealthy man, but he was one of them. He was one of them. You understand? He was in, he was in Auschwitz. He wasn't the French Jew, people who sent the Jews up to the concentration camp and now they're trying to make him like us. So when he got up to speak, the children turned around to look at him. And he got up and he said, I Kindela! And he started to cry. Children, and he lost it. He just fell apart. He couldn't speak. I Kindela! He started to cry. So you have to watch, Rabbi Lau is the best storyteller in the world. I mean, maybe second best to Yossi Jacobson, but he's an incredibly good storyteller. He says, this man gets up and all the children turn around to look at him. And he says, I Kindela! And he starts to cry. And Rabbi Lau says, all of us, we were done. We finished crying. There were no more tears left in our ducts. We were done. We never cried. They were hard as stone. He says, this guy is standing up on the stage and crying. And you look around. And you see one kid doing like this. And a second kid doing like this. Within five minutes, all 300 of those children were bawling. They were crying uncontrollably. They cried for a long time. And finally, one of the oldest boys stands up and he says to this French man, this French Jew, thank you for the gift. Thank you for the gift. So he says to them, they told me that you're refusing the gifts. We were told that you're not taking the gifts. You're not taking the gifts. He says, no, 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 the gift of tears. That we were able to cry. Fast forward 50 years, 50 years. Rabbi Lau was the chief rabbi of Israel. We had the Intifada. And there was a uh, suicide bombing. So Rabbi Lau runs to the hospital where they brought in the victims, the wounded. And there's an old man laying on a gurney, an old man laying on a stretcher. And Rabbi Lau passes him. And suddenly here's Rabbi Lau. So he turns around and goes back to the old man. He says, you know who I am? He says, no. He says, I know who you are. I've been following your whole life, he tells him. I've been following you your whole life since you're nine years old. And he says to him, I was the boy who got up on the lawn and said to this French Jew, thank you for the, for the gift of tears. So you tell me, is soft hard or soft? <laughs> what's, what's softer, soft or hard? So what's been chush the urcha? They were not tired from traveling. They allowed themselves to be soft. Chush means the journey of softness. 
And the journey of softness resulted in being able to accept HaKadosh Baruch Hu and to be accepted on the mother. Beautiful, huh? I didn't write this. I just teach it. Now, girls, let's go back to page. Let's go back to page 10. Okay? Please. Clocks have no hearts. Let's go. Wait. Oh, I did not use my time efficiently today. I'm starting over here. Page 10 at the bottom. You know how I work. I read only the underline. If you read the underline, you'll be good. Okay? The Jewish people rested on Sinai. As all the Jewish people. If somebody wants, I have one more here. From Moshe Rabbeinu to the simplest of the simple. To the simple, to the simple. We're unified in an absolute unity. Believe Echad, not just as one person, but with one heart. Like we learned the two sikhs before this one about what which comes first. Next on the line, in the Funnish movement, is understood from this. As by Alayid, how could it be that all people have one heart? How could it be that all people have one heart? So the Rebbe says in this sikh, the following, it's understood. As by Yidin is Faran and the Kuda Shemaleh, that every Jew has a point inside his heart. In Velchel is Gleich and Zichois. Where there is a neutralization, kish echad, believe echad, like one person, one heart of all people. We're individuals. We're supposed to be individuals. That's a strength, right? We're individuals. We are individuals, but someplace deep, deep, deep inside of us, we're one. Not we're one because we lose our individuality. We're one because we go past our individuality. We reach a place where things are so absolute and so simple that we're one. Page eleven. Onundem is bashtan in der uftu. This is the nature of the effect from Ayichan Sham Yisrael, Negadahar, that Israel raised, rested there adjacent to the mountain. Translate that, but please look inside. They came to the mountain. Why did they come to the mountain? To Makabozan, Kibel, Teirami Sinai, to receive the Teir Makadish Baruch. When Yidin came to the mountain, and the reason they came to the mountain, to receive the Teira is by Zayn, is Galagavad, and this caused a revealing, a bringing forward from Dini Kudush of Alev, that point in their heart. Was Gleich Tzichois, Alaviyenin, where everybody is neutralized, our differences are wiped away, we're all the same. And the Rebbe says, in them, this idea, that you come to Har Sinai, and the first thing you do is accept. I accept. I accept. You find a place inside of yourself where you be able to be soft, not hard, and you're able to accept. And that acceptance is the place where we're all the same. So we accepted Hashem. We accepted one another. In them, this idea of allowing yourself to be weak, right? How do you say it in, 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 in religious terms? What does it mean to be, to be weak? To let, uh, to let yourself believe. Let yourself believe. If a person has proof there's a God, yeah? If you have proof there's a God, if you have a you have hundred proofs there's a God, do you have a relationship with him? I'm asking you a question. If you have proof that there's a God, do you have a relationship with him? No. You have proof that there's a God. How do you have a relationship with, 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 how do you have a relationship with God? Forget the proof. I done. Close that up. I studied. I figured it out. Now I forget nothing. To have a relationship with Hashem, you have to let go of your brain. You let go of the proof. What they call making a leap of faith. Dilu, go away from the brain which brought me to God. And now just relate to him simple. Yidin's most important preparation for Hasid, I was relating to him simple, not fancy, not complicated, simple. And the Rebbe says these words. In dem Of all things. The most important thing we needed to do to prepare ourselves to receive the Torah was to be simple, was to be soft, was to put our brain aside and be able to accept. It. And in being soft, or as the Gemara says, being weak and putting our brain aside in order to accept, we became unified, not just with Hashem, but with each other. You understand? Turn the page. Page 12 now, okay? And the Rebbe continued. (sighs) 
der chiddush. So an ato niglesa from matan teni. See what I'm reading? I just read the words that are underlined. Anybody want a copy? I have one more left. This novelty of ato niglesa from matan teni. When Hashem gave us the Torah, He revealed Himself to us. We saw Him. Is shalei be'erech is a whole other level than whatever we had before. Lift name matan teni. Before Hashem gave us the Torah, we also had the Torah, right? You all know the Gemara. The Gemara says that other generation learned Torah. That Shays learned Taylor, that Chaneich learned Taylor, that Mr. Shalach learned Taylor, that Neach learned Taylor, that Shane learned Taylor, that Abel. A lot of people learned Taylor. And Abraham, it's a Yanke, finish the sentence. Practice the Taylor. A lot of people studied the Taylor, and Abraham, it's a Yanke, practice the Taylor. So if people learned the Taylor before the Taylor was given, and some rare people practiced the Taylor when the Taylor before they were given, so what happened? Hashem gave us the Taylor. So the difference wasn't in the book. It wasn't in the information. It wasn't in the data. It wasn't even in the ritual. It was in the simplicity. It says the Rebbe, lift name out on Teda before Hashem gave us the Teda. People study Teda, but their study of the Teda has to do with their own intelligence. It's like a person who has proof there's a God. Their intellect and whatever else is necessary to know to make this conclusion. It's movement it's understood. If a person's relationship with Hashem, a person's relationship with the Torah is based on how much he understands. If something is based on my understanding, how much of it do I accept? Only what I'm able to understand. Nor as I feel, only so much. This particular student is able to reach for Every person understands Hashem a little more, a little bit less. With different degrees of intelligence. So one understands one is smarter and understands more, one is less, one understands less, but it's all limited. However, when Hashem gave us the Teda, is the Lim with the Teda and at this point when we're studying Teda to such a level, the event of learning Teda is not just how much of God's knowledge I have, but let's say it in English. I have a relationship with God. I have a relationship with God. Says the Rebbe was hot on lanes. He had anger with it. I'll say because he wrote himself into his title. Now my relationship is infinite. Huh? When are you closer to your husband? Do you like him because he's smart and talented? Or you like him and you forgot why? Seriously, you forgot why? If you like your husband because he's smart and he's articulate and he's handsome and maybe even kind. Huh. That relationship is a it's, a it's a it's a business deal. It's not a relationship. It's an arrangement. When you forgot why, then you're married. Yidden before Martin Taylor, study studied Taylor, did mitzvahs was all about how much they understood. Then Hashem gave Himself to us. He revealed. He gave Himself to us. And we gave ourselves to Him. We became weak, but the best kind of weak. Not weak. I have no more strength. I have enough strength to permit myself, how do they say, in psychology, to be vulnerable, to be weak. Then we had a relationship with him, not with his intelligence. God's a pretty smart guy, right? But if you have a relationship with God, automatically have a relationship with his wisdom, and not a limited relationship, a relationship based on what he is, not based on what you understand. So the Abish that gave us the title, the same title we had before, it stopped being a business deal. It stopped being an arrangement. It stopped being a negotiated connectedness and it became a real relationship, an unconditional relationship. And the most important part of that process was to be weak, to be vulnerable, to be soft. Like one person with one heart. Let's keep reading, bitte. Okay, now. This is connected. The Jewish people rested as one person with one heart. And I'm reading on. Everybody knows. So when you learn Torah, no two people are alike. One understands more, one understands less. One enjoys this part of learning, another person is a different part of learning. We're all different people, and we all learn differently. And our differences are in our understanding. Says the Rebbe Zayin ben Egea Sogas Atayra. How much a person reaches and understands the Tayra separates one person from the next. Abed, page twelve, first column, last paragraph. Look inside. Thank you. However, page twelve, first column, last paragraph, beginning of the paragraph. Abed, dos vasayid fabinsi. The fact that a Jew binds himself 
Dorech libin atenu through with learning tenu. As is cool lechad mit the nes atenu to be one with Hashem. That's not that I understand you. That's I accept, and I submit. And when I accept and I submit, all of me is connected to all of you. It's an infinite bond. And the basis for it is not hardness, it's softness. It's not strength, it's weakness. It is dog by the godl, shebik dayim, and cotton, shebik tanim, is by the biggest of the big and the smallest of the small, exactly the same. Relationships, relationships neutralize people. I mean, relationships, people are funny relationships, right? Relationships neutralize people. If you have a very, very smart person, a man or a woman, a genius, right? A lot of them have very hard times having normal relationships. They do. Why? Because everybody's dumb. No one, no, everyone's so stupid, right? Someone's so smart. Their brain works faster than everybody else, but they don't know how to tie their shoes. When they button their shirt, the button goes in the wrong hole, but they're geniuses, yeah? If a genius manages to marry a simple person and they have a real relationship, how does that happen? How? My genius doesn't matter. My humanity matters. My genius, I'm, so, so I'm smart, but I can't tie my shoes. She's not so smart, but she knows that I make sure I get dressed in the morning and I brush my teeth. I get up. I don't miss my appointments. Right? Two people make a marriage work, not that because they're the same, but because they have the same purpose, which is to have a relationship. So when it comes to learning, Taira, this one is smart. This one is not. When it comes to relationships, we're exactly the same. When their union is fabundin with leif on yidin, second column, page 12, listen to the heart of the Jewish people. Valepnimis and the kudas ha leif on yidin, in the innermost point of the Jewish heart, is meya yechid the shebenefesh had the yechid of the neshama, the pint of the yid. Girls, I want to tell you something. I have very, very little time and I have a lot to tell you, but I'll tell it to you anyway. Where is the neshama? Where is the soul? So there's a big machlekes amongst yeah. ma- ma- in, in Jewish thought. In Tanya, it says that the neshama is in the brain. In some places, it says the neshama is in the heart. Even though the heart is just a pump, it's the simplest organ. I didn't hear you. In the, blood? In the heart. No, in the blood. It, it either says in the brain or in the heart, which pumps the blood. I, I mean, it says in the Chumash. That the blood is the life. But I didn't ask you about nefesh, I asked you about neshama. But okay, your point is well taken. I mean, I'm not, you're right, you're also right. So wait, so wait, so which is true? Is the neshama in the brain or in the heart? Or in the blood? One of the answers is the complexity of the neshama is in the brain. The simplicity of the neshama is in the heart. The fancy of the nisham is here. The simple is here. So you tell me which is higher, your brain or your heart? Huh? Who is higher? Yeah. What's bigger? What's a greater accomplishment? To have a complex existence or to have an existence where you're able to accept? To be hard or soft? Strong or weak? So which is better, the brain or the heart? I'm confusing you uh, on purpose. The answer is depends in what? If you want to talk about what makes us human and separates us from animals, of course the brain. (laughs) But if you want to know what makes us human, (laughs) in other words, not human that we're smart and we're sophisticated, but that we have the ability to have relationships with other people that are unconditional, it's in the heart. The Asagra, Sadi God writes with such passion. There's no doubt whatsoever that the neshama is in the heart. And everybody else says it's in the brain. And Chassidus, they explain it this way. The Yechid Hashem Nefesh is here. The neshama is here. The part of the neshama that we're all the same is here. The part of the neshama we're all different is here. In the brain. Okay? Ish echa, the life echa doesn't come from the brain. It comes from the heart. And the heart doesn't mean emotion. It means the ability to be soft. To let go. When das meant second second page twelve second come second paragraph from the bottom. When das meant this is the meaning of a yichan shom yisrael ishah chad levuchad israel less than one man one heart that kumendik neged the heart the Jews come to the mount who has had gedav zayin maimed have seen him at the tater where Hashem is going to come down to the mountain and give them the tater. Hot das they coming to the place the location location location. 
by Yidin Arayz Girofen, it aroused the Jewish people. The Isgalus, the revelation, from Zayyar, previous to the Kudus Aleph, the innermost point of the heart. What says by Allah, Yidin Bashab, which all Jews had equally. On that Gilud, and this revelation of an Akudish of that point of the heart that neutralizes our differences and makes us all the same, <speaking in Hebrew> made us a vessel to get to the divinity of Tayyip. They came to the mountain. The mountain represented Torah. The mountain evoked in the Jewish people to be soft. How soft? To accept Hashem unconditionally. And by coming soft and accepting Hashem, they discovered that they can accept one another. They showed they, show they can accept one another. Questions or comments? You better speak now because I got more to say. I'm Astarojna. <laughs> I know that word, yeah? <laughs> when you go on the trains, Astarojna, the doors are going to close. Astarojna, warning, step inside in the metro in Moscow. But what do they say it? Anybody? Something Zakarayate, right? I got it wrong. What does that mean? It's going to close. Astarojna, warning. Okay, Astarojna, I'm moving on. Siv Zain, Obed, however, now girls, head, head, what's my name? Kid, yeah. A couple gets married, yeah? And they accept each other. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful and it's hard, but it's not enough, right? Why isn't that enough? But the other stuff happens before. Oh, okay. <laughs> when I say it takes 20 years, it doesn't spontaneously happen after 20 years. It's a learning exercise. And you're not learning him, you're learning yourself. It's not in our nature to accept. You learn how it's hard for me. I, in my relation, my wife, I'm, I don't have to get her to accept me. I have to get me to accept her. I'm not an accepting person. I'm a judgmental person. I have a big ego. You understand? So that's what takes 20 years, how to get past yourself. The other side of it is you, you, your husband <laughs> is intelligent and he's artistic and he's musical and he's talented and you like those things. The other side of a relationship is, right? You don't just accept Hashem. He's a pretty smart guy. He wrote a good book called the Bible, right? They're still using it. <laughs> it hasn't gone out of print. They keep reprinting it, huh? Why? Because it's a popular book. The other side of that coin is you have to use your strength. Monday, the Jews travel to a place called Tired. On that day, the whole avoid is to be weak and soft and accept and submit. The next day, they start to use their brains again. Because our relationship with Hashem, like your relationship with your husband, is complicated. On the one hand, it's from the heart. Accept. On the other hand, it's from the mind. You can't just accept. You have to share things, right? What is the cliche that they say? What is the cliche? You know the cliche? You know the cliche? Huh? It's not enough to love your husband. You have to like him also. <laughs> it's not enough to love your wife, to like her also, yeah? You have to be friends. But for this, you have to share things. This is not hard. This is brain. We, we accepted Hashem. But we had to enjoy his Torah. So the Shchoidesh Sivin, we became soft and weak. We accepted. The next day, we started to argue again. You understand? Abed, this preparation. The Jewish people rested at Sinai as one man with one heart. It's not the end to that again. Only one step. One part of having a marital relationship is accepting your spouse and being accepted by your spouse and being vulnerable to them and being trusting. Right? Because this incredible, top of page 13, this incredible Maila of Bittal and Unity, you're able to open up to Hashem and say, Oh man. But there's another side to the coin. The tachlis from Lenin Teda is, on the other hand, after you accept the Teda, you have to learn it. As this of the Lenin, you should learn the Teda. With the one of our saga, you should absolutely understand it. Which is why, in conjunction with the other side of this coin, it was necessary. After we accepted God, then we had to like him. 
Biker means I'm smart and he's smart. We share, we can sit and talk to each other of common interests. So the other side of the coin are the one and the most, the most important thing in any relationship. And by the way, one day you're going to have children and you're going to have to accept them. And you'll find out that accepting your kids may be harder than accepting your husband sometimes on rainy days. <laughs> huh? And they have to accept you. All real relationships are unconditional. The relationship with the person you marry is unconditional. And relationships with the products of that and the fruit of that marriage, which is your boys and your girls, they're going to be disappointed. Some of them, some of the time, I promise, you accept. This is what God gave me. This is what God gave me. Whatever it is, it's mine. Whatever it is, it's mine. It said it five times a day. Whatever it is, it's mine. Whatever it is, it's mine. Whatever it is, it's mine. But you know what? They're not all idiots and not idiots in all things. Some of them are kind of talented. And they, they have minus also. The other side of the acceptance is the relationship. So the Shchaydish Sivan, we did the first half of the relationship, accepting. It's the most important. Bay's Sivan, which was Tuesday. Gimel Sivan, which was Wednesday. Dalas Sivan, which was Thursday. And Hay Sivan, which was Friday. We also prepared ourselves. But now we prepare to have a relationship with him based on strength, not based on weakness. And we read on. The is the bottom of the first column, page 13. The first preparation of the Teda is, as we said about five times already, the Jewish people rested like one man with one heart. Tachas, a bit of ultimate bit was pale that affects tap on the second column page 13 now, please. As Allah Yidn and all the Jewish people Ishaqhad became soft. So soft that we accepted God. So soft that now accepted the gods of one another. Amen. However, what's the other side of the coin? Fun Shani Basivan, beginning with the second day of Sivan. Is his Khmation this asik? Moshana begins to work them. Asik means to work. It's not enough to be soft. It's not enough to be accepted. Now you got to use your brain and your heart and your senses. You have to work hard to prepare yourself to receive the tail. Was the meat very gemeint? That this means those parts of the preparation to receive the tail that affect as the mitziah to Adam, that the form of the person, the ego of the person, that the individuality of the person, Zol Zayn Matim Beroi, should be fit and appropriate, the Kelly and the vessel Kibbutz that can receive Tzuka Ba'asatayim. The first day, we accept. The second day, we're judging again. We're not judging because we're taking back our acceptance. We're judging how to live on that basis. And now we're engaged in using our mind. We have to become a nation of priests. That's Tuesday. Mitzvah Sakbala, that's Wednesday. Prisha, that's Thursday. We'll talk about this in the next year. They made the Jewish people holy. And in these preparations, there's a difference in one Jew and the other. individuals. Difference. So, the made the most important part of the preparation. The hardest thing in a marriage, except, and I'm telling you, it's true of children. You accept your kids, you accept your kid, you accept it, and you love it. And that's what makes them healthy. If you're constantly deciding if they're good, it's not normal. When your parents want their children to be high achievers, and it's very important that you be successful, it's very important. But more important than anything else is unconditional love. And if the child feels like they always have to impress you and do something, and the unconditional love is lacking, it's not, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a parental relationship. It's not normal, it's not healthy, it's not good. You need both. First you accept, and then you instruct. First the Yidden accepted, and then Moshe instructed. Turn to page, turn back to page 14 now, back to the end of the season. Okay? Says, Last few lines, girls. I read that paragraph before. Once Jewish people achieve a bit, which happened on the Monday, the first of Sivan, when we accepted Hashem and Hashem accepted us and we even accepted one another. Father Tzich is now a requirement as Yidin Zon Zich Raptram Fun Dem Bitzel Otsum that you should go away from the softness, from the weakness, from the bit, from the acceptance and discriminate. And occupy yourselves with the other aspects of preparation. And the other aspects of preparation are critical, are discriminating, are different with using your brain and your heart. Questions or comments?
Good sikh, huh? Yes. Very good. I didn't write it. I just taught it. Chazak. Thank you.